I love Christmas gifts. Amen. Uh, I love giving them, Amen. and I enjoy receiving them as well. Uh, even as my sister and I got older, my mom and dad would never put the gifts under the tree until at least Christmas Eve after we had gone to bed, or maybe even Christmas morning before we got up. And that was at least in part because she knew what I would do if I found a gift under the tree with my name on it. I'd pick it up, feel how heavy it was, turn it around and look at it from different angles, shake it, right? All in an attempt to figure out what was in the package. The truth is that Ashley still does me that way. <laughs> the gifts can't go under the tree until time to go to bed Christmas Eve. Otherwise, I'll be snooping under the tree to find, figure out what is there for me. But have you ever gotten a Christmas gift that came in an odd-shaped package, and you couldn't figure out for the life of you what was in it? You did all the things, you picked it up, you determined whether it was heavier or lighter than you were expecting. You turned it around, you looked at it from all the different angles, you shook it, but you just couldn't figure out what was in it. And Christmas came, and it was time for you to open your gift. You began to pull the paper back for a peek, right? But you still couldn't figure out what it was. You removed the rest of the wrapping paper, turned it around, looked at it from different angles, and maybe even then still couldn't figure out what that gift was. I feel like that's my Monday and Tuesday each week uh, when we come to a new chapter in Revelation. I read the text, take my Bible and turn it every which way, step away and go for a walk, have a cup of coffee, hoping that somewhere along the way some enlightenment is going to come. And eventually, as I wrestle with the text, as I ask God for help, as I read what others have written, Eventually, the scales begin to fall from my eyes, and I can start to understand what God is communicating through his word written by his servant, John. By the end of the week, I love the passage that I get to stand here and preach to you. That's been my experience this week as I've studied Revelation 8. I'm excited to share this chapter of scripture with you this morning. And so if you haven't already, please go ahead and turn in your Bible to Revelation 8. It's page 969 in the Black Pew Bible in front of you. Revelation chapter 8, page 969 in the Black Pew Bible. Starting in verse 1, this is the word of God. When the Lamb opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. Then I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and seven trumpets were given to them. And another angel came and stood at the altar with a golden censer, and he was given much incense to offer with the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints rose before God from the hand of the angel. Then the angel took the censer and filled it with fire from the altar and threw it on the earth. And there were peals of thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightning, and an earthquake. Now the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared to blow them. The first angel blew his trumpet, and there followed hail and fire mixed with blood. And these were thrown upon the earth, and a third of the earth was burned up, and a third of the trees were burned up, and all green grass was burned up. The second angel blew his trumpet, and something like a great mountain, burning with fire, was thrown into the sea. And a third of the sea became blood. A third of the living creatures in the sea died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. The third angel blew his trumpet, and a great star fell from heaven, blazing like a torch. And it fell on a third of the rivers and on the springs of water. The name of the star is Wormwood third of the waters became wormwood. Many people died from the water because it had been made bitter. The fourth angel blew his trumpet, and a third of the sun was struck, and a third of the moon, and a third of the stars, so that a third of their light might be darkened, and a third of the day might be kept from shining, and likewise a third of the night. Then I looked, and I heard an eagle crying with a loud voice as it flew directly overhead. Woe, 
Woe, woe to those who dwell on the earth. At the blast of the other trumpets that the three angels are about to blow. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for your word this morning. And Father, we pray that you would open our eyes, give us eyes to see, give us ears to hear. Help us to understand your truth. And God, we don't want to be mere hearers of your word this morning. We also want to be doers of your word. And so we pray that you would help us by the power of your Holy Spirit. Teach us, convict us, rebuke us, encourage us. Help us as we follow you. We trust these things in your hands and pray in Christ's name. Amen. The title of our sermon this morning is the end is coming. But how do we know that the end is coming? We know because Revelation 8 tells us that the end is coming. And we see here in Revelation 8 that the end is coming through the prayers of the saints. The end is coming through the prayers of the saints. Now, don't misunderstand me. One of the things that we see here in Revelation 8 and throughout the book of Revelation is that God and the Lamb are in charge. God and the Lamb are in charge. In fact, we see in verse 1 that the Lamb is the one who opens the seventh seal. Remember back to chapter 5 where we first saw a scroll with seven seals. The problem was that after a thorough search of both heaven and earth, no one was found worthy to break the seals and open the scroll. That is, no one but the Lamb, the Lamb who was slain, but is now standing as the resurrected Lord Jesus who conquered death, hell, and the grave. And then in chapter 6, we saw the opening of the first six seals. The first four seals represent tribulation for believers and judgment for unbelievers in this life. The fifth seal was the cry of the martyrs. The sixth seal represents the final judgment that is coming. And then in chapter 7, we saw that all who are in Christ are sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, brought through the tribulation of this life, and ultimately we will experience final deliverance because we have been washed by the blood of the Lamb. Now we come to chapter 8 and the opening of the seventh seal, and again, it is the Lamb who opens the seal. But this time, when the Lamb opens the seal, John tells us that there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. I think in one sense, this is the calm before the storm. You know, like the eerie silence that we feel in the natural world before a powerful storm. And judgment is coming. This is the calm before the storm. Zephaniah chapter 1 verse 7 says, Be silent before the Lord God. The day of the Lord is near. Zechariah chapter 2 verse 13 says, Be silent all flesh before the Lord, for he has roused himself from his holy dwelling. See, the Lamb has opened the seventh seal and the trumpet judgments are about to begin by decree of God and the Lamb. God and the Lamb are in charge. We see the same thing in verse 2. John writes, Then I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and seven trumpets were given to them. Notice that the angels stand before God, and the trumpets are given to them. They're God's angels, and the trumpets are given to them by God. And then in verse 3, the angels are given much incense. You get the point, don't you? God and the Lamb are in charge. But the prayers of the saints matter. The prayers of the saints matter. Look at verse 3. And another angel came and stood at the altar with a golden censer. And he was given much incense to offer with the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar before the throne. Now back up with me for a moment to verse 1. Remember the silence? Why was heaven silent for half an hour? We said that it was the calm before the storm, right? I think that's true, but I also think that the context shows us that something else is going on here as well. 
Look, Leon Morris writes, the saints appear insignificant to men at large, but in the sight of God, they matter. Even great cosmic cataclysms are held back on their account. And the praise of the angels gives way to silence so that the saints may be heard. John Piper says, in this silence, after the opening of the seventh seal, we have a dramatic presentation of the importance of the prayers of the saints. Before the scroll is opened, God wants to make clear to John and to his readers, us, that the unfolding of the end of the world will happen by the prayers of the saints. Look at verses 4 and 5. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints rose before God from the hand of the angel. And the angel took the censer and filled it with fire from the altar and threw it on the earth. And there were peals of thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightning, and an earthquake. I wonder, brothers and sisters, have you ever felt like your prayers don't matter? This text is for you. Have you ever felt like your prayers hit the ceiling and then just fell back down? They didn't make it to God. This text teaches us that our prayers rise all the way to the throne room of God and not one of them is wasted. Don't miss the connection here between the prayers of God's people and the outworking of God's purposes to save and to judge. Because after the prayers of the saints rose before God from the hand of the angel, the text says, Then the angel took the censer and filled it with fire from the altar and threw it on the earth. Now to fully understand what is going on here, I think we have to back up to chapters 5 and 6. Remember back in chapter 5, verse 8, John wrote, And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And then in chapter 6, with the opening of the fifth seal, John saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the witness they had borne. Cried out with a loud voice, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? We see similar cries to this in other places in the scriptures, particularly in the Psalms. Psalm chapter 6, verse 3, the psalmist writes, My soul also is greatly troubled, but you, O Lord, how long? He writes in Psalm 13, verses 1 and 2, how, how long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I take counsel in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all the day? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? Psalm 35, verse 17, how long, O Lord, will you look on? Rescue me from their destruction, my precious life from the lions. Psalm 90, verse 13, the psalmist prays, Return, O Lord, O Lord, have pity on your servants. Psalm 119, verse 84, How long must your servant endure? When will you judge those who persecute me? See, brothers and sisters, the truth is that God's people have been longing for justice and the coming of God's kingdom forever and crying out for the kingdom to come. In fact, consider the Lord's prayer in Matthew 6 where Jesus taught us to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven and here in Revelation 8, brothers and sisters, we see that prayer being answered. God answers the prayers of his people by hallowing his name and judging the world. John Piper says what God wants us to believe about our God-exalting prayers is that none of them is lost. None is wasted or pointless. They are stored up on the altar of God until the proper time when God pours them out on the earth to accomplish his great purposes 
of judgment and redemption. The implication is that it is not pointless to pray, brothers and sisters, again and again, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Will your prayers be among the prayers answered when the prayers of the saints rise before God and God responds by ushering in his kingdom? Brothers and sisters, Revelation 8 should encourage us to pray big, God-exalting prayers. We long for the gospel of Jesus Christ to go forth to every unreached corner of the earth. We long for God to advance his kingdom. We long for Christ to return. We long for him to make all things right. We long for deliverance for God's people and justice for God's enemies. So brothers and sisters, Goshen family, let's pray toward that end. And know that the end is coming through the prayers of the saints. We also see in Revelation 8 that the end is coming with judgment on the earth. The end is coming with judgment on the earth. But before we consider the details of the four trumpet judgments of Revelation 8, I want to take a step back and look at the bigger picture of what is happening here in the book of Revelation. You see, there are some who think that John is giving us a chronological account of all the events that are to take place in the last days. They don't all agree on what the events are or when they happen, but they see the narrative of Revelation generally proceeding in a chronological fashion. So you've got the seal judgments, then after that the trumpet judgments, and then after that the bowl judgments. And it's understandable that people would read Revelation this way because that's how we read Genesis or Joshua or Matthew. We're, we're used to events being presented in a chronological order. But remember we've said that Revelation is apocalyptic literature. It's different from Genesis or Joshua or Matthew. It's highly symbolic. John is telling us about real events that really are going to happen. Deliverance really is coming for the redeemed. Judgment really is coming for God's enemies. Jesus really is going to return. Satan really will be defeated forever. And all the redeemed really will be with God forever in a new heaven and a new earth. But John is telling us about these things that really are going to happen in a symbolic way because that's the way that he sees them in the visions that are given to him by God. So, so much of the imagery of Revelation is intended to be symbolic. When we read it too literally and too chronologically, we end up accidentally misinterpreting the book. It seems to me that the events depicted in the seals, trumpets, and bowls take place over the same period of time. I agree with Nancy Guthrie, who writes, The seven seals of Revelation 6 and 7, the seven trumpets of Revelation 8 through 11, and the seven bowls of Revelation 16 each show us the same period of human history. The time between the life, death, and resurrection and ascension of Jesus and the day he returns in glory to establish his kingdom on this earth and to usher in the new heaven and the new earth. See, we understand this when it comes to the Gospels. We don't understand the events of Matthew happening first and then Mark and then Luke and then John. We understand that each gospel writer is presenting a different perspective of some of the same events of Jesus' life and ministry that all happened during the same period of time. This afternoon, some of you are going to go home and watch a football game. Go Ravens, right? And inevitably, there will be a play in that game that is somewhat questionable or controversial. You'll see the play in real time from one angle. Then after the play, the TV network will show you the play from a different angle. They may even zoom in and slow down the frame so that you can uh, see more clearly what happened. Did the receiver catch the ball or did it hit the ground before he actually had possession? It's the same play, but you're looking at it from different angles and perspectives in an effort to see more clearly what happened. Something similar is happening in Revelation with the seals, trumpets, and bowls. 
Now, one of the things that we do see as Revelation moves from the seals to the trumpets to the bowls, I think, is a general ratcheting up of tribulation and judgment. While they describe the same events, the trumpets seem more severe than the seals. And the bowls seem more severe than the trumpets. Which to me indicates that tribulation and judgment on the earth will only increase until Christ returns, vanquishes the enemy, and establishes his eternal kingdom. Well, let's talk about these trumpets. We're told in verse 2 that there are seven angels who are given seven trumpets. We see four of the trumpets here in chapter 8. We'll see trumpets 5 and 6 in chapter 9. And finally, trumpet number 7 in chapter 11. This, of course, is not the only place in the Bible where we find trumpets. Exodus chapter 19. A very loud trumpet blast announced the presence of the Lord at Mount Sinai to give his law to his people through Moses. Numbers chapter 10. God told Moses to craft two silver trumpets to be used in calling the people together, announcing war and in celebration. Perhaps the most prominent time in the Bible when trumpets were blown was at the Battle of Jericho in Joshua 6. For seven days, the people of Jericho were warned of the coming judgment of God. And when the seven trumpets sounded on the seventh day, the walls of Jericho fell down and God's people captured the city. So this is not the first time in the Bible that trumpets are associated with the coming of the Lord in judgment. In fact, Joel chapter 2, verse 1 says, Blow a trumpet in Zion, sound an alarm on my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming. It is near. Amos chapter 3, verse 6, Is a trumpet blown in a city and the people are not afraid? Does disaster come to a city unless the Lord has done it? Zephaniah 1, the great day of the Lord is near, near and hastening fast. The sound of the day of the Lord is bitter, a day of trumpet blast and battle cry against the fortified cities. See, brothers and sisters, these trumpets are a warning. These trumpets announce judgment. And there are four of them here in Revelation 8. We find the first trumpet in verse 7. It says, the first angel blew his trumpet. And there followed hail and fire mixed with blood. And these were thrown upon the earth. A third of the earth was burned up and a third of the trees were burned up and all green grass was burned up. It's interesting to note that some of the trumpet judgments are similar to the plagues that were poured out on Egypt leading up to the Exodus. This first trumpet reminds us of the seventh plague of hail. Shriner states, that the fire accompanying the hail probably refers to lightning strikes so that the picture is of a massive storm with hail and lightning. You get a clue that John is using symbolic language here when he writes that the hail and fire are mixed with blood. This first trumpet represents God's judgment on the dry land. We see the second trumpet in verses 8 and 9. John writes, the second angel blew his trumpet, and something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea. A third of the sea became blood, a third of the living creatures in the sea died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. We see the symbolic language that John uses here when he describes something like a great mountain. It was burning with fire and thrown into the sea. John says that a third of the sea became blood, resulting in the death of a third of the living creatures in the sea. And uh, what does this remind us of? But the very first plague in Exodus 7, where the water was turned to blood. Schreiner helpfully writes the Nile turned to blood literally. But John takes this image and uses it apocalyptically to describe the effect on the seas and oceans. The second trumpet represents God's judgment on the oceans and seas. We see the third trumpet in verses 10 and 11. The third angel blew his trumpet and a great star fell from heaven, blazing like a torch. And it fell on a third of the rivers and on the springs of water. The name of the star is Wormwood. A third of the waters became Wormwood. Many people died from the water because it had been made bitter. This third trumpet Judgment affects the fresh water, the very water that we need to drink and live. 
Well, we see something similar in Jeremiah 9, verse 15, where God says, Behold, I will feed this people with bitter food and give them poisonous water to drink. The imagery of a star falling from heaven, blazing like a torch, comes from Isaiah 14. Nancy Guthrie writes, This trumpet demonstrates that the very things in this world that people consume, expecting them to be life-giving, often end up poisoning them. Trumpets to those who think that their sins add to their lives, that sin ruins everything. In fact, it will be their ruin. The final trumpet of this chapter is the fourth trumpet, which we find there in verse 12. The fourth angel blew his trumpet, and a third of the sun was struck, and a third of the moon, and a third of the stars, so that a third of their light might be darkened, and a third of the day might be kept from shining, and likewise a third of the night. We've seen that God's judgment affects land, sea, and fresh water. Here we see that it also affects the heavens. This trumpet judgment reminds us of the plague of judgment in Exodus 10. Isaiah describes the day of the Lord as a time when the stars do not shine and the sun and moon yield no light. And Jesus says that these kinds of things will accompany his future coming. He says in Matthew 24, verse 29, immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. See, in these four trumpet judgments, we see God's judgment poured out on land, sea, rivers, and springs and the heavens. Tom Schreiner highlights the point of these judgments when he writes, all of life in this present age is affected by human sin. And the temporal judgments of God in history point to and anticipate the final judgment. Goshen family, do not put your hope in created things. Everything of this life is passing away. Even the things that we consider most secure our hope must be in God rather than his creation. He alone is worthy of our trust and our confidence. We've seen that the end is coming through the prayers of the saints. We've seen that the end is coming with judgment on the earth. Finally, in verse 13, that the end is coming with judgment on earth dwellers. Verse 13 introduces us to the final three trumpet judgments, two of which we'll see next week in chapter 9 and one in Chapter 11, look at verse 13. Then I looked, and I heard an eagle crying with a loud voice as it flew directly overhead. Woe, woe, woe to those who dwell on the earth. The blast of the other trumpets that the three angels are about to blow. The scene here is ominous. An eagle crying, woe, woe, woe. One woe for each trumpet judgment. It's as if the messenger cried out, if you think that was bad, just wait. The worst is yet to come. Notice that the woes are directed at those who dwell on the earth. Who are the earth dwellers? Earth dwellers in Revelation always represent unbelievers. Jim Hamilton writes, these are the people who live for this world. These are people who are not concerned with God and his purposes. God will judge them for their refusal to honor him as God and give thanks to him. Friends, if you are not a follower of Jesus this morning, I want you to know that these woes in verse 13 are directed at you. You are among those who dwell on the earth. That these woes announce the judgment that is coming for you. That this passage is intended to warn you. Well, would you hear the warning of these three woes? The, the trumpets are about to blow. And judgment is coming. Woe, woe, woe to those who dwell on the earth. The, the good news for you this morning is that the trumpets haven't blown yet. It's not too late for you. You can still repent. You, you can still turn from your sin. You can still place your trust in Jesus. You can still be made right with God. The warning of this passage is actually evidence of God's mercy toward you. 
It, it doesn't feel like mercy when you read Revelation 8. But the fact that we have Revelation 8, the fact that we can read it this morning and that we can be warned by it, that is God's mercy to us. That you can be made right with God. You can today turn away from your sin and place your trust in Jesus. The message of the gospel begins with God's creation and our rebellion. God created us to glorify him. The problem is that you and I have sinned. You and I have rebelled against God, our creator. And because we've rebelled against God, we deserve God's punishment for our sin. We deserve these judgments. But Jesus came, born of a virgin, lived his entire life having never sinned. And then he went to the cross and he died to pay for your sin. That if you would repent of your sin, if you would place your trust in Jesus, you can be made right with God. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. You can be saved from the judgment of Revelation 8 if you would today call on the name of the Lord. That's our hope. And for those of us who are followers of Jesus, the call of God on our lives this morning is to warn as many people as possible that judgment is coming. We warn them that judgment is coming. And we tell them that deliverance from judgment is available to all who repent of their sin and place their trust in Jesus. Who in your life needs to hear this message? Who will you share it with? Who will you call to turn from their sin and place their trust in Jesus so they can escape the wrath to come? Even in judgment, the heavens declare the glory of God. Do you see in Revelation 8 that all of human history is moving toward a day when God will make all things right? Because part of making all things right is bringing judgment on those who rebel against him and refuse to turn from their evil ways. Perhaps you remember singing, he's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. If you bowed your knee to him, the end is coming. Just as sure as I'm standing here right now, reality, that reality is either bad news for you or good news. It's bad news if you never turn from your sin, if you never placed your trust in Jesus, because you too are under God's judgment and will experience the full measure of his wrath unless you repent. But it's good news for you if you've been washed in the blood of the Lamb. Because in response to our prayers, God is going to judge the wicked, deliver the saints, and make all things right.